Hello everyone, I am Jonathan Little, and today we're here with episode number 239 of Weekly Poker Hand. I want to thank you all for being here with me for all those 239 episodes. If you're not already following me on Twitter, go there, follow me, at Jonathan Little. We've been doing a lot of giveaways. So far, I think we've given away about some five or $10,000 worth of live poker buy-ins. Also, memberships to my training site, pokercoaching.com, physical DMB books, we're giving away lots of fun stuff, and you can get entered into those giveaways at, well, by following me on Twitter at Jonathan Little. So, for the next few weeks, we're going to be going through hands from a Veronica and Friends game. This is a 1-3 no-limit cash game, where stacks are usually quite deep, and the action is very loose, very splashy, everyone's having an absurdly good time. Uh, this is what happens whenever you have someone who curates a game, they pick people who they want to play with. Veronica, here with $415, gets to pick her own game. That's nice. And um, she picks a fun one. I've had the opportunity to play on it one time, and I um, got crushed. I'm trying to remember how much I lost. Uh, most of it was the one big hand where I had top pair. <laughs> Turns out I thought top pair was good enough. My opponent showed me the nuts for, you know, 400 big blinds or so. Go figure. As you see, the wine's already flowing. Everyone's having a good time. So, let's get right to it. Usually, like I said, this game is overly loose, overly splashy, overly aggressive, and that's good. <laughs> so, let's take a look at what we have. Veronica opens it up in the hijack seat with King-10 offsuit to $30. Now, I'm going to presume there was a straddle. Um, sometimes there are, sometimes there aren't. suppose we should go ahead and talk about this. If there was a button straddle then I would probably just fold this hand. It does not look like there's a button straddle here. Um, Gina is a relatively loose player. She will occasionally get after it. So we see small blind, easy fold. Big blind, easy fold. Now on around to Kathy. So I'm going to presume Kathy straddled. If she did straddle, obviously you're playing king, ten of diamonds in pretty much all situations. It does say it was only 10, uh, 20 more to call, so she must have straddled. Um, in games like this, straddles are very, very common, very frequent. And in reality, if everyone is straddling and you want to get invited back to the game, you better straddle. Otherwise, you may not ever get invited back. Um, private games, and I'm, I don't know if this is actually a private game more than a curated game for a live stream, but um, whenever you have the opportunity to play in games like this, especially if you do care about the longevity of uh, your time at the game, you definitely want to splash around, live it up, give a lot of action. Not so much to where you become just a horrible loser, but you do have to splash around. And uh, don't think you can sit here and just be a weak, tight knit. So here we have Kathy with King Jack of Diamonds. Very, very easy defend. Not much to see here. Flop comes 10, 6, 5. Um, this is actually a board where I think Kathy could conceivably lead. She did not. She decided to check. Let's talk about leading flops. Um, I don't do a whole lot of leading of flops. And, you know, in reality, if you're playing a game that is very loose and splashy, you have to be much more cautious with leading flops because people are just going to call a lot. But the times you want to lead are when the board should be very good for your range, as it is here, right? This is a spot where Kathy should have all sorts of junk. And also a spot where Veronica, knowing the game is not absurd, or knowing the game is absurd, should start with mostly strong hands, which means that she doesn't have a lot of high cards. So how do high cards connect on 10-6-5? Well, the answer is just not very well, right? So this is a reasonable spot to lead for Kathy. If she does lead the flop, she needs to be betting the turn very often and likely betting again on the river. You have to ask yourself if that is what you want to do. <laughs> Some people don't like running triple barrel bluffs. But in this spot, I think it would actually be reasonable because... The board's going to get a lot worse, and it's going to change in various ways on the turn in the river, and when that happens, you just get to keep bluffing. Like, say a spade comes on the turn, Kathy can easily bluff that. If a diamond comes, she picks up lots and lots of draws. If a king or a ten comes, she's thrilled. If a queen comes, that's fine. If a nine comes, it's fine. If an ace comes, that's probably scary, so that's fine. So as you see, I think I've named off pretty much every card in the deck. So in this scenario leading is certainly viable. Now, she checks, and Veronica makes what appears to be a $30 bet. I would tell Veronica to bet a little bit bigger in this spot. The board is very coordinated. and in So she did bet 40. In very coordinated 
on very coordinated boards, you typically want to bet with not all of your range. So if you're not going to bet with all of your range, that often leads to you betting with a polarized range of your best made hands and your draws, or just some total garbage, right? So either you have the best hand for sure, or you have a hand that has mounts to improve, or you just have nothing. Now, on a board like this, you have to be very careful betting with nothing, just because it's so easy for Kathy to have something. So that means Veronica should mainly be betting with her best made hands and her draws, which means that if she bets, she has just a very nicely polarized range. And in that scenario, you can bet big. So on this flop, if the pot started at um, 65 bucks or so, I would bet probably 50. Veronica bet 40, which I think is fine. I do think a lot of players in cash games have a default bet size of two thirds pot, which is you know not necessarily bad, but there are definitely spots you're gonna want to bet bigger or smaller. And as the board gets more and more coordinated, you're gonna wanna bet bigger. So I think I'd go a little bit bigger, but 40 is fine. Now back to Kathy. I think Kathy has a hand she must stick around with. The question is, how does she go about sticking around with it? And just like I was discussing leading the flop, I would also probably check raise here. Not always, but probably. The problem with check calling, especially when you're out of position, is that say the turn's a blank and it goes check, check on the turn, very often that just means your opponent has some made hand that's not folding on the river. So you don't get to bluff those. What if uh, you check the turn and, and Veronica bets? Well, then Veronica, Veronica probably just has a good hand. And if she just has a good hand, that means you're not getting to stick around either and you're in bad shape. So check calling out of position is quite dicey. The hands you do want to check call with are the hands that have the most showdown value, like the junky draws, I mean. Like you really don't want to check call here with 9-8, for example. 9-8 is a hand you either want to raise or fold. But King Jack does make some sense to check call. It does beat some worse King highs, Queen highs, etc. So... I can get behind calling, but I think in this spot, I usually just take the aggressive line, especially in cash games where even though this game is loose and splashy, no one's just trying to give away $400. So I think if you check raises, it's something like 120 and then bet something like, well, I guess we see Veronica has 245, 345 left. So if you check raise to 100, then bet like 100 again on the turn or 120 on the turn and then jam the river, that may work. Problem is Veronica's a little bit short stacked. Maybe you're supposed to just check raise a flop to 100, 30 and then jam the turn. That's probably best. That's going to put Veronica in a pretty nasty spot with everything besides just like over pairs, right? And Veronica's certainly not a net, so that's probably the best way to go about this. It's always important to take stack sizes into account, and when there is a $10 straddle, remember, we're not playing 1-3 anymore. Now we're playing 1-3-10. So a $450 stack, which was 150 big blinds, is now only 40 big blinds, and that changes things. Anyway, Kathy does call, sure. Turns an ace. And um, Kathy should definitely check. This is a spot where Veronica will bet some aces on the flop. Maybe all of them. Who knows? And so you can't justify leading here. So she checks. And now Veronica bets again. So this is a spot where in a regular cash game, a normal cash game, I would definitely recommend Veronica to check. This is a spot where when your opponent check calls, they're going to have a lot of ace highs, especially ace highs with backdoor draws. And those hands are obviously not folding now. But in this game, that tends to play a little bit loose, a little bit passive, I think you can get away with value betting again, as Veronica does. Notice she does have the best 10, right? That is relevant. If she had a hand like 10-9, I'd be way less inclined to bet because 10-9 loses to King-10. So um, I don't mind this value bet in this game. The only problem you run into, though, is if Kathy does decide to play aggressively. Now, I don't know anything about Kathy's game. I've never played with her. But... If she's going to be raising with lots of draws at this point, then betting is pretty rough. Because if you bet 60 and then Kathy just goes all in, as she probably should do with a strong polarized range of perhaps two pair and better and then lots of draws, there's not a whole lot you can do about it besides fold. So betting opens you up to getting crushed. But if your opponents are going to be relatively passive, I think it is perfectly fine and probably just a good bet because you are pushing value, right? And then you can check behind on the river. So you're getting value here from draws which essentially protects, protects your hand a little bit. And you can just check behind on the river because you know that Kathy probably has a lot of ace-x in her range too. So Kathy does call. So should Kathy call here with the king high? I would say probably not. The problem with calling here is that if Veronica does have a hand like she has, she's not going to bet on a queen river. So you can't really get a check raise in at that point. If Veronica has a hand like 9-8 and is barreling, well, she's going to probably bluff again on the river and then you're going to have to fold the king high anyway. So that's not good. 
If she has, well, any made hand, you're, you're losing. So this is just not going to work out well. Floating the turn out of position is very often not a great strategy. I mean, I get the idea that she has a king high, which is not so bad, but you just need to get out of the way here. It's too likely you're in bad shape. The ace is not the card you wanted to see. So you got to fold, even for a $60 bet. By the way, if Veronica is going to bet the turn, she should bet on the medium to small side, and that is what happens. On the river, just goes snap, check, check, and the hand's over. So the question, though, in my mind, is should Veronica value bet the river? And I think the answer is probably yes in a loose, splashy, not absurdly aggressive on the turn and river game. And from my experience at Veronica and Friends, that is exactly what we have here. A lot of players are only raising you with very good hands. I imagine Kathy's either calling or folding on the river. And I think if Veronica put in a value bet of $60, $80, $100, somewhere in there, she's probably not going to get called by king high, but she will get called some portion of the time by a 10 or 6 or pocket 8s. And I think Veronica probably left a little bit of value on the table. That could be completely wrong if we know that, you know, Kathy just never pays on the river. But this is where it really is important to study your opponents. Um, Veronica and Friends is a game that happens at Stone's Gambling Hall often, right? It happens, I think, um, well, at least once a month. And these players all know each other. I'm trying to think, whenever I was in this game, I played with one, two, three, uh, four of these players at least. Um, maybe there are other players who are going to come in or out. I don't know. But... These are regulars, right? And when you're playing against regulars, you really need to drill down on the footage you have on them so that you know their tendencies. Like if we know here that Kathy check call slop, check calls turn and loves to check raise the river, well then Veronica probably shouldn't bet the river. But if we know Kathy will check call, check call, check call a king high, well now Veronica has a very easy value bet. I talk about this a lot in my book, Mastering Small Stakes No Limit Hold'em, about how to really try to figure out what your opponents are doing wrong, and then I explain all the adjustments you should be making to beat them. And if your opponents are just calling stations, as is often the case at 1-3, the easiest way to win is just bet, bet, bet with a really wide, linear range of value hands, just all the best value hands. And right here, I think King-10 definitely qualifies. I may even bet a hand like Jack-10 here. It'd be thin, but I think it would still probably be fine if we are playing against the calling station, who also does not raise aggressively. So that's going to be it for this hand. Thanks again for being here. You can get my book, Mastering Small Stakes No Limit Hold'em, at jlpoker.com slash mastering. Everyone likes it. Gets, gets great reviews. It's one of the best-selling poker books on the market. So if you're not reading it, you're getting behind. <laughs> All right, check it out. Have a great week, and I'll talk to you next time.